Chapter 16 is on the endocrine system. The endocrine system is the second control system in our body. And it's important to remember that it acts along with the nervous system to help to coordinate and integrate the activity of the body cells. So it influence, influences many different activities, metabolic activities via hormones. And hormones are chemical messengers that are transported in the blood. So it's different than the nervous system because it takes longer for this to occur. And endo, the prefix endo, it means inside, whereas exo means outside. So in this case, the endo means that the hormones, the chemical messengers, they travel inside the blood or the extracellular fluid. Now, the large majority of all endocrine system mechanisms are controlled by negative feedback mechanisms. And what this means is that the stimulus is going to be opposite of the response. So, um, in the example of insulin, insulin works after we, eat, after we eat a large meal. So, the blood glucose level increases. That's the stimulus. Once insulin is released, it's going to take that glucose into cells and the response would be a decrease in glucose. So since the stimulus is opposite of the response, it's a negative feedback mechanism. So this table is going to show us a comparison between the nervous system and the endocrine system. So for the nervous system, Remember that it works very, very quickly, works very rapidly, can take milliseconds. Whereas the endocrine system responds very slowly and it takes much longer. There's chemical messengers, which are hormones released into the blood. For the nervous system, there are short duration responses, but for the, long, for the endocrine system, there is a long duration response. The nervous system uses quick electrical impulses called action potentials and also chemicals called neurotransmitters, whereas the endocrine system uses these chemical messengers called hormones released into the blood. The nervous system works at very specific pathways, specific locations, which involve axons, but the endocrine system uses a very diffuse location, meaning that the chemical messenger is released into the blood and it travels all throughout the body. So those hormones, they travel long distances for the endocrine system. And the nervous system is for short distances because those neurotransmitters, they go from one neuron to the next neuron. So it's important that you can compare and contrast the nervous system with the endocrine system. So our overview of the endocrine system is that it controls and integrates many, many different functions. First, one of which is reproduction. There's growth and development, so a very long-term process that happens over a lifetime. Controls and maintains electrolytes, water, and also the nutrients balance of the blood, so very, very complex. And there's a group of hormones that controls this. The endocrine system also regulates cellular metabolism and energy balance. It mobilizes body defenses, so involved with the immune system, and exocrine, which would be outside of our body, it's not going to involve hormones, so it produces non-hormonal substances, and these would be things like sweat saliva released outside of the body. And so exocrine glands have ducts that carry, carry this secretion to the membrane surfaces. So our next slide is showing um, kind of the list of various endocrine glands that are present in the body. And uh, some of those are the pituitary gland, the thyroid gland, parathyroid, which is located just posterior to the thyroid gland, the adrenal gland, and the pineal gland, to name a few. 
Now, the hypothalamus is very important. It is what's called the neuroendocrine organ because it has a portion of it that is, controls the, the nervous system and also a portion of it that controls the endocrine system. So it's kind of a combined mixed organ. And there's some glands that have both endocrine and exocrine function. These would be things like the placenta, the gonads, and the pancreas. So, for example, the pancreas has a digestive function, that's the exocrine portion, and it also has the endocrine function, the part that releases insulin and glucagon. And there's also a bunch of other tissues and organs throughout the body that produce hormones. So the location of these selected um, various endocrine organs are shown on the slide, and you should know the hormones that are released from them what function they have, and then what are the homeostatic imbalances associated with those. So um, the first that we see in the brain is the pineal gland, and it's responsible for releasing melatonin. Below that is the hypothalamus. This is the neuroendocrine organ, again, because part of it is involved with the nervous system and part of it is endocrine. Then the pituitary gland has a very important role pretty much all over the body. It, it, it produces a group of hormones. The thyroid gland is involved with me, uh, metabolism, our basal metabolic rate. The parathyroid glands are tissue, it's tissue that's embedded in the posterior region of the thyroid gland. And it is the most important gland that plays a role in calcium regulation. Then the thymus gland has a role in causing T cells specifically to mature. The adrenal gland has huge functions. The adrenal glands sit directly on top of the kidney. So they're also called the supra renal glands for that reason. But there's various layers of the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla that produce various hormones the pancreas, insulin, and glucagon, and then the gonads, the ovaries, and the testes. So our next slide is showing us the chemical makeup of different hormones. And hormones are defined as long distance chemical signals, whereas autocrines, look at, you can see by the prefix auto, it means that it affects itself, so a cell releases a chemical that then affects itself. Paracrine, it kind of looks like parallel. It's going to release a chemical that affects cells nearby. And so the autocrine and the paracrines are local chemical messengers, whereas the hormones are going to release chemicals that affect glands all throughout the body. They're gonna travel a long distance. So as far as the chemistry of these hormones now, there are mainly two classes. There are amino acid-based hormones, and there's also steroids. And steroids are gonna work quite different because they can go directly through the plasma membrane and then affect the DNA. So these hormones, the way they work is once they're released, they then travel to their target tissue and they bind to a specific receptor and that hormone then causes an effect. And the effect can be very diverse. There's many different possibilities as you can see here listed in this slide. So the main difference between the two types of hormones are that the amino acid based hormones and these include protein based hormones peptides, they're all water soluble. And this means that they bind to a specific receptor on the plasma membrane. Once they do this, then they act via G protein second messengers and they cannot um, enter the cell. So they don't, they don't diffuse directly through the membrane like lipid soluble hormones do. These would be steroid and thyroid hormones. So the thyroid hormone is one of the exceptions Chemically, it's amino acid based, but it acts like a lipid soluble hormone. So the next slide is gonna show us 
how these water soluble hormones work and they mainly use five different steps and the little cartoon illustration to the top of this slide kind of simplifies this it uses a g protein so the g protein is kind of like a, a messenger the hormone is the amino acid based hormone that binds to the receptor which is step two then the g protein is the messenger that then tells the enzyme to release a second messenger and we can see that process shown in the larger diagram so the lipid soluble hormones now they the lipid soluble steroid hormones like um, any testosterone um, estrogen any of those as well as thyroid hormones they have this ability now to diffuse into the target cell and bind with intracellular receptors. And again, this is totally opposite of the water soluble hormones. So they form the receptor hormone complex, they enter the nucleus, and then they have the ability to bind directly to the DNA. And because of this, they have the ability to initiate more DNA transcription to produce mRNA and essentially directly cause the production of proteins. So this slide shows us this direct action. So as we look a little closer here, we can see in step one that the steroid diffuses through the plasma membrane. It binds to the intracellular receptor. So that's what we see right here. In step two, the receptor hormone complex then it can also diffuse directly through the nuclear membrane. So not only did it diffuse in step one through the plasma membrane, but in step two, it diffuses through the nuclear membrane. When it gets through the nuclear membrane, it then can bind directly to a specific DNA region and then cause that region of the DNA to be transcribed into mRNA and thus a specific protein can be produced. 